What is belonging? What does it mean to belong to a community, a country, to humanity? In 1998, artist Esther Bryant inspired a group of volunteers to create one of the largest symbols of belonging in Canada. The creation of the monumental textile art involved hundreds of people from Victoria to Newfoundland to the Arctic. From the small historic village of Williamstown, Ontario, Quilt of Belonging reached out to the communities of the world, in effect bringing together stories, ideas, and many cultures to show the world that there is hope and a place for all humanity. When I had the idea, I knew that this was going to be an absolutely mammoth project. Because if you want to talk about everyone, that you have to make everyone's there. That's going to make it large, just by its nature. Because we're a town of 250 people and not a big community, and a fairly um, small community in terms of eth ethnic or cultural diversity because we're basically a Scottish Scottish uh, Celtic area. We have French and English and you know Swiss and Dutch farmers and but not a whole lot of diversity in the town. The fact that people open their hearts and were willing to go and learn about others and were eager to discover and got more and more excited as they met new people and, and had to travel, had to, had to leave the, the comfort of Glengarry to, to head out and, and were, were open to that and, and challenged by it. So the word started to spread out in the community. If you want to, this is what we want to do. We know it sounds impossible, but if you want to come, there's a place for you to work. She was doing this project with all the countries, who the people from the different countries who lived in Canada. And, uh, but she said, I need all sorts of volunteers, and I need people in the office, and I need people to do, uh, answer the phone, and uh, do errands, and do research, and do uh, mailing. And I said, whoa, 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 back up, did you say research? And because I was retired from the library after 40 years, and I said, research, I can do that because I can do that on my own and I can come in. So I came in once a week with the research that I'd done during the, during the week. But the first thing I had to do was find out which countries were represented in Canada. And I'd worked in the library in the children's department for over 30 years and I had never really sat down and figured out. I knew there were lots of countries. I would have said, I don't know, maybe 75 or something like that. So I went through the immigration records. The immigration department were wonderful. They sent us all their big books of immigration. I went right back to the 1880s and went all the way through. It took three months to go through. And I finally went into Esther and she kept saying, how's it going? Oh, I'm getting there, making this list, you know. So I finally went into her and I said, well, I think I've got it all up, all done. How many countries do you think is involved? And she said, oh, I don't know. I said, 192. And then she said, oh, she went white. <laughs> She said, oh my goodness, it's going to be huge. How can we do this? And I said, well, I'm sorry. That's the answer, 192. The idea of the quilt, you know, kind of was like a good stew. It was, it was um, cooking for a long time in bits and pieces. But it, it came together when I went to Slovakia. I returned with my dad in 1994, who said to me, Esther, take me home. And I had no idea what he was talking about because my dad's a missionary and we've lived all over the place. I was born in France and we moved and moved and I've never had a permanent home until I got married. So um, I said, home, where's home? Because dad had never talked about it. He, he had hidden his past. I think it was too painful. It was, um, Slovakia was communist for almost 50 years and he left at the end of the war. And so for him to bring that out was painful. And we went back to find his brother. Now you had two boys that were raised in the same family, but it had 50 years of different experience. Um, one under repression, one under freedom, you know, and you could see that there was a bond in the way we were all family. It was emotional time of, of reunion. And yet you could see the impact of the lives they had lived and how that had formed who they were. And um, so I began to realize that whether we think it or not, um, first of all, the roots, the parts of our past, really inform who we are today. We may not be conscious of it, but the values that we get, the way we look at life, our, our personalities are formed by, by what has come before. Britt Leppa was involved early in the making of this textile art. 
For her, it was important to be part of a project in which she could celebrate her Swedish roots while being a proud member of the Canadian family. My husband was a captain on the Swedish-American line, the ocean liners. He was never at home. I was alone with the children and it was hard on him. He missed us so much that it was really, really a challenge. So he was offered a position in Montreal Harbor as a, a shore captain there. And we decided to move to Canada, settled in Montreal. And uh, yeah, home away from home became the Norwegian Seaman Church, where we could meet with other Swedes, Danes, Norwegians, and a lot, a lot of sailors. <laughs> <laughs> My roots are still in Sweden. I often feel that I'm like a cut-off flower and I'm put in a very beautiful vase and that vase is Canada because it's fantastic. But my roots are still, still in Sweden. Taking that little trip up to Williamstown in the beginning when this all started, as often as I could really, I went up there to see how it was growing and what was coming out of it. And all, I, I, all the people I met that, uh, that got together, and we were all so amazed. We were all so amazed just to be a part of it. It was overwhelming. Esther's trip to her father's home in Slovakia started her search for her own roots. When I came back, brought back pieces that had been given me there. When you meet somebody after years, the thing that you want to do is give, a, give gifts or give pieces. The pieces that were given to me in Slovakia that, that were so precious were pieces of textile. Um, somehow they kept doing this beautiful needlework um, through the difficult years, through war, through rape, through the difficult things that happened. So I put them all together, photography, handmade paper, family photographs, scraps of fabric, painting, um, writing, to try and catch all these lost years and to try and deal with the new ideas, the, the different points of view. And the show was called Return and it was opened by the Slovak Embassy. I was um, a one woman show in a gallery. I was really nervous because I had normally painting and drawing and and um, fiber arts in a more universal theme. And this was a very particular theme. This was our story, my dad, myself. And so I thought, well, will this be of interest to other people? But somehow by telling that story, it opened the door for so many others and stories began to pour out of people. And when I saw that, I realized there was a deep need in people to say, I'm here, look at me. This is who I am, this is my story. In a way to say, I matter, I have a place too. And so Quilt of Belonging was born out of that. I decided this couldn't be done with painting because painting is the domain of a few people. But when you work with textile, we all wear it. We all express who we are our geography, our history, the time that we live in. We mark our special occasion, and it's basic to our survival, like food. So textile was something that everybody could use. And the definition of textile in this case had to be very wide because what people bring in their suitcase, you know, expressing who they are and what, what they're holding on to may, may be made out of Banana, banana peels, it may be made out of bark, it may be made a miniature carpet, it, it could be silk, it could be a piece of family clothing, whatever, you know, it could be a teddy bear, you know, whatever. People that hang on to that gives them that comfort, that sense of this is who I am, this is a piece of the past that I, I need to cling to for whatever reason. This symbolizes um, my value and what's important to me. Lou Sekolowski and his sister Milka worked on the Macedonian block. He included precious parts of his family's history that his mother had brought to Canada. This is the original one actually, uh, was worn by my mother uh, on her wedding day uh, with a bridal outfit. And uh, on this they put what we call the tokas, and let me just put, pick one. They're, they're different styles, uh, whether they're rectangular or round. Uh, or, sorry, this one, again, with the coins at the bottom. 
it's all part of a decoration on the wardrobe. These roots, these um, tokens or symbols of, uh, of identity are passed on from a generation to generation. And again, it's not something specific to the Macedonian people, but to all peoples throughout mm -hmm. the world. That, uh, it's important uh, the parents, grandparents, and great grandparents leave something to the new generation. Your mom could have brought pots and pans and dishes, <laughs> but what did she bring? She brought, That's right. you know, her yeah. wedding, pieces of her wedding gown, her dress. That's she right. bought she bought the threads, and it's the thread that has carried her story, and which is why we were using textile to, to tell a story of humanity, because it is what people hold on to, yeah. and it expresses who they are. The challenge was to design the quilt so that the textile blocks were connected in an inclusive way while at the same time maintaining the distinctive cultural identity of each piece. I was looking for a symbol that would express all of humanity, the essential being of humanity, because each one is going to tell their story. And so when I looked around and thought about it, the, the shape that really stood out for me was the hexagon shape. It's the most elemental shape in life. It's the, the shape of the carbon molecule from which all life is made. And the, when you put the hexagons together in nature, they form the beehive, which in actual fact is the strongest structure that, we, that exists. The strongest structure that we have in nature is, is that combination of hexagons. And so it became a really um, symbolic structure and grid for showing how do we put the pieces of humanity together to make something that's cohesive and that's really strong. Inside that hexagon, however, I've put as a diamond shape and that is the light colored piece on which people then get to tell their story and they get to tell it in their own materials. Um, I wanted to use the full spectrum of light, the color spectrum of the light spectrum because that again is essential to life. So we had to be able to move to the, through the color spectrum so that no matter who you were, where you were, you had a kind of a glow and a unique quality to who you were. Matter of fact, um, some of the colors just did not exist and so needed to be painted or woven or over dyed or threaded, whatever it took to give you that that band of color that moved all the way through the, uh, the color spectrum and to give that entire scope of humanity. Though this is called a quilt, it is not an ordinary quilt and so the structure has been changed. The pieces are not butted one next to the other. This, in this piece, each piece is put separately on a background that holds it together. And the spacing between them is separated and connected both by winding wool that sits on top. It's a beautiful cording that borrows pieces and colors from one side and the other and joins them. It both frames the block so that each one has its own individual personality and, and is still can be seen on its own as a separate entity. At the same time, it ties them together with the neighbor. And it was an incredibly challenging task to find the right spacing. How far before one encroaches upon the other, how far before they seem like they're not touching or not, not in relationship one with the other. And it's a little bit like that in our society. We have to have a balance between our personal privileges and our community responsibility, realizing that everything that we do impacts our neighbor. And so we have to always have that dance between what's my space and what's common space and how what I do impacts you. And maybe sometimes give and take a little. And the symbolism of that is really a statement about how we find a way to live together, even though we're very different one from another and create that, that space of respect for each unique being. The quilt volunteers reached far and wide across Canada to find an individual or a group from each nation of the world and from every Aboriginal group in Canada who would create a block about their culture. The volunteers took 46,000 hours and traveled over 215,000 kilometers, more than half the distance to the moon, to ensure that everyone was included even if that person was the only individual from a tiny nation living in Canada. We had to go to the United Nations and overseas 
and agencies and Washington if they didn't have embassy or representation or an association. We came to see the Canadian Ethnocultural Council and they had contacts, but again, their contacts were spread, you know, fairly coast to coast, really, almost across Canada. So we just determined whatever it took, what ever was required, somebody was willing to go or, or to help out. And so Quilt of Belonging gradually came together, piece by piece, community by community, 263 blocks in total, 120 feet long and 10 feet high. The first row, the foundation row to the First Nations, that's where our story begins in Canada with all our First Nations. So we have all our First Nations, Inuit and Métis and they found their place of color in that border. And then the three rows above it are all the other cultures of the world that have come to Canada. And actually, as we have at least one person from every country of the world, we have the world in there. So the world sits next and builds upon those First Nations. And then the top is a band of color that is made of 1,200 separate pieces, and then the colors begin to interweave, because that's also part of our story. We marry somebody of a different culture or a different background, and we become a new story. And so that top border is the new story being created. Now, it's interesting that if you look really carefully at that, and like all art, there's often a lot of symbol in it, you'll notice that it's red on the two sides, that the Canadian block, which is a beautiful maple leaf that's been done with iridescent gold beads and fine gold thread, sits in the center. And if you put all the other colors together in the light spectrum, they make white. So in a sense, the whole 120 feet is like a very subtly done symbolic Canadian flag. When I decided to make the project, the way that I thought that we could show all of humanity was to have on the founding row all of our First Nations and Inuit and Métis, all our Aboriginal people. Their story needed to be told and respected. Now that right away took us from Newfoundland to Yellowknife and right across the country. For Russell Roundpoint of the Aquasasne Mohawks of Cornwall Island on the St. Lawrence River, being part of the project helped educate people about First Nations living in Canada. The quilt of belonging, um, if you think about it, the quilt is something that offers comfort and warmth and protection. So, you know, and, and the whole belonging part of it, 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 it embraces the same philosophies that we have as Mohawk people where there is an inclusiveness. And what better way to symbolize the fact that we are all here together in one place, there, there's no other earth, there is no other place that we can be. So we need to be uh, wise enough to come together and to share what's there. There's an old Mohawk philosophy of one bowl, one spoon, and, and it really fits into what the, the quilt em, uh, symbolizes. The fact that uh, uh, everyone is here together and is connected. A quilt is about connecting patterns and squares in, in, in order to bring the unity that we need. And that's basically what Mohawk philosophy is about. Mohawks are a people of peace and people don't seem to realize that. We are one of the few nations that really base our whole philosophy on the concept of the great law of peace, which is in, in actuality a reality for the Mohawks. Uh, headlines will state otherwise, media portrayals you know, notwithstanding. Mohawks are about peace and, pe and, and the people are about taking care of family, taking care of their neighbors, and, and being a good all-around citizen. I would like to see the people of Akizasne and the Mohawk people, uh, because there are more than one, one Mohawk community, Akizasne is part of a, of a larger nation, uh, I would like to see us be prosperous, but not necessarily financially, but prosperous in our hearts and our minds and be, to be able to have the riches of our culture more fully embraced than, than what it is. Uh, I think it's very important that children are able to be confident to go out into the world knowing where they come from, to know their heritage. The Mohawks primarily use the resources that were here, and that would be more in the lungs of, of skins, but basically they started using uh, sweet grass and other grasses to weave and to make patterns, and they would use clay and other materials. 
The Cultural Center at Aquasasti encourages the community to learn and practice traditional Mohawk culture so that it is not forgotten. If you don't carry on traditions like that, then as a people, people are left to guess what you are about. For Tawana Miller and Barbara Littlebear, beadwork is an integral part of keeping First Nations culture alive. It is passed on from generation to generation. It's too, because I learned this from my great-grandmother, and now I've taught my daughter and I've taught my granddaughter, so, you know, it's, it's going on and on and on. It hasn't stopped. So it's uh, very fulfilling. Yeah, my mother started teaching me how to do beadwork at the age of 11. Okay. And, uh, you know, she took her time out and uh, brought me and my sister to the, all the different powwows, so we got to learn the dances and learn how to sing. The Seneca block that I created, there was the domes, which uh, represents the sky dome between um, the sky dwellers and here on Earth. And I have the, um, the, the three spokes in the center, which represents corn, beans, and squash. It's not just about the sky, but everything that between the sky and the earth that grows on it. Celine Mackenzie Vuxen is proud of the resourceful nature of her people, the Dog Rib, in the Northwest Territories, part of the Dene Nation. In creating her block, she used natural materials from the land. I was able to use the caribou hide and um, the challenging part about that was that I had to go to our community to, to find the, the caribou hide. And, and uh, the rewarding part of it was that I also included my mother, now that I think about it. Uh, she was a big part of it. Uh, we both share uh, sort of a similar experience. I'm a second uh, generation second generation of residential school survivor. And my mother had gone to school too. So I wanted to put her, her sewing that she had given me uh, into, into, into the block and as well as tell her story. I went home to see my mother on the weekends. I would go home to my community in, in, in Fort Ray, that's what they used to be called and I was working in Yellowknife, and I saw the beadwork that I grew up with, and I remembered how, how to bead, and I started uh, beading uh, a pair of mucklucks for myself. As a young woman, Celine made the traditional footwear with the help of her mother. Mucklucks represent the traditional way of life and the ability to survive extreme cold. Celine passed her mucklucks on to her daughter, who wore them proudly as a symbol of the Dene people. Vicky Utpik, a fashion designer, uses traditional materials to make the kind of clothing which the Inuit have been wearing for centuries. I'm from Huaktak, Nunavik. Uh, it's in uh, northern Angava Bay, northern uh, Nunavik. I chose seal skin because it's Inuit uh, usual fur we use up north and some leather just for background and I and some embroidery on it that uh, Inuit people use a lot to make designs. Vicky believes it is important to make Inuit clothes using both modern sewing techniques and traditional hand sewing. She feels that it is equally important to create employment opportunities for her people. Her goal is to design clothing that can be made in sewing centers in Nunavik villages. The Inuit communities had the occasion to see Vicky's work and the Nunavik block when Quilted Belonging traveled across the far north for two and a half months. For volunteers and Inuit alike, it was a tour to be remembered. Quilted Belonging has been exhibited across Canada and seen by one and a half million people. Museums, galleries, and special events have taken every opportunity to show its magnificence and share its message. Donc j'ai reçu une invitation par la Poste pour aller voir Fibre du Monde au Salon des Métiers d'Art, où l'œuvre était présentée durant tout le mois de décembre. Michel Boulanger is the executive director of the Abenaki Museum. Et quand j'ai vu l'œuvre devant moi dans toute sa splendeur, les magnifiques couleurs, je suis restée bouche bée. 
Et tout de suite, j'ai essayé de convaincre Esther qu'elle devait être présentée au Musée des Abénakis. La mission du Musée des Abénakis est de faire découvrir la riche culture des Abénakis entre nos visiteurs, mais également avec les gens de la communauté. Cette courte pointe-là est en fait représente l'image du Canada culturel, multiculturel tel que nous le connaissons aujourd'hui. Alors pour nous, cette courte pointe-là, cette œuvre-là, va permettre à nos visiteurs d'engendrer un dialogue entre les nations, de faire découvrir qu'au Canada, il y a des Premières Nations, mais il y a également des nations immigrantes qui ont tissé et forgé le Canada d'aujourd'hui. Et ça, pour nous, c'est très important. The exhibit at the Abenaki Museum has special meaning for Norm Shack. He has traced his ancestors to families who had settled in the area hundreds of years ago. I'm even more thrilled because of the Abenaki background in my family. And uh, for me, having participated in this, it's also another step in uh, feeling all the, the closer to that Abenaki background. Uh, and you, you look at the whole range and see maybe the block you most associated with you see that uh, the culture you were raised in is really one element of something that's much larger. And if we look at things through a lens of win-win rather than win-lose, uh, we can see the richness that that brings. Um, of course, everybody is aware of the richness of, uh, uh, of cuisine. Uh, nobody, nobody today would say, uh, well, I'm only interested in what my mother cooked, uh, but it goes well beyond that. It's the richness of literature, it's the richness of customs, and, and this is a, a visual display of the beauty and richness be behind that uh, for those who, uh, who uh, are accepting and feel that all these cultures uh, contribute to the whole. Norm was introduced to the quilt through his wife Jeanette when she worked with Saika Hinky to create a block representing Brazil. Quilt of belonging makes her feel part of a larger community in Canada. And I think it also makes people realize this country and how it embraces all these people from all over the world. And we have that here. I think it's wonderful. Claudette Voigt became interested and volunteered in the project precisely because of its message of acceptance of all people. Le projet m'a toujours euh, fascinée à cause du multiculturalisme. Euh, J'ai une fille qui a été dans une école euh, où le multiculturalisme était très important et très euh, présent parce qu'il y avait, c'était une école publique, mais dans un milieu où il y avait euh, des Italiens, des Grecs, des, 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 des Afghans, des Vietnamiens. Et on a toujours voulu donner euh, à notre fille cette idée que... Il n'y a pas seulement des Canadiens et des Canadiens français, il y a vraiment tout un peuple, à, à, en fait un monde à découvrir. Et, et ça a toujours été pour moi une fascination. Les quelques fois que j'ai été exposée en fait à, à d'autres cultures, ça m'a vraiment comme frappée. Et c'est toujours resté avec moi, j'ai toujours été fascinée pour euh, apprendre plus en fait au niveau de toutes les cultures du monde. The importance of feeling included and welcomed as a newcomer and immigrant was something that Esther experienced personally during the making of the quilt. When I was making this project, I was a landed immigrant. And so I got to look at it with fresh eyes. What does it mean to be part of this country? I had traveled a lot, gone back to Europe and seeing what it had been like in, in a you know, communist world and how terrifying that had been because I, I had the stories from my family and I experienced some of it. So all of these things made me just realize what a privilege it is. I became a Canadian citizen myself as part of my story in making the project. I became part of this family and it is 
a family that I treasure, and it is a great privilege. Feeling included in the larger framework of a nation motivated Eric Lam, Angela Yick, and Judy Ginn to make the Chinese block to remind people about the Chinese community's long history in Canada. We have Chinese community within Canada, started from the, um, the, the people coming here to build the national railways, and then progressing all the way down to the present days with different types of people and different types of um, backgrounds. And it came, we came a long way to build up this community. And I'm very proud of um, our community that stretched from coast to coast to coast. I think over and then I decided with the, a dragon because the symbol of dragon means uh, China. China always. So I decided so many dragons. At last I find it the wrong one in the middle and then four butterflies in the corners, and the li water lily as well. Most of all, Chinese like the dragon because dragon means luck. Quilt is a start of something. I don't know what, but people will know this is a signif very significant in the, in the form of uh, living together in, in some way. Many people came to Canada with the dream of a better life. Owning a home symbolized belonging and the achievement of that dream. Noi abbiamo lavorato forte, io e mio marito abbiamo lavorato forte. Una volta che avevamo la casetta avevamo tutto. Perché in Italia non era facile avere una casetta facilmente. Per gli emigranti è una cosa importantissima. So, questo simbolo della casetta è, è proprio importante per gli italiani. Chiunque ha una casetta è già contento. Pierina Costanza e Carmela Buda stitched the house in the Italian block, representing a popular song in Italy in the 1950s, which symbolized the dream of owning a home and building a life in Canada. E avevo mio marito che lui mi aiutava. Um, lui si metteva e faceva da mangiare e allora io mi sedevo la mattina fino alla sera a lavorare su questa casetta. Questa è la casetta degli italiani in Canada. Ci sta la canzone? Avevo una casetta piccolina in Canada con vasche e pesciolini e tanti fiori di lì là e tutte le ragazze che passavano di là Dicevano che bella la casetta in Canada. It's a beautiful. Rosalie Bernier used the delicate elements of nature to express her country's unique cultural beauty. Alors, la Centrafrique est un pays spécial avec les papillons. Les gens, quand tu vois ça, ils pensent qu'on a détruit la nature. Mais non, mais si les papillons tombent comme la neige là au mois d'octobre, novembre parce qu'ils viennent de la grande forêt équatoriale dans le sud. Alors euh, les papillons ont juste une vie, hein, 24 heures de vie, et un papillon, c'est pas long. Alors tous les, ils tombent et puis les ailes euh, sont partout. Les enfants les ramassent et puis on fait plein de choses avec. Alors c'est comme ça que mon frère a fait des choses, euh, la scène pour montrer la scène de la vie quotidienne, des bus de femmes, des oiseaux, c'est tout ça. En tout cas, c'est vraiment, c'est ça que je voyais que ça représentait mon pays, c'est pour cela que je l'ai choisi. Dans mon pays, j'ai toujours été une femme, une fille très engagée. Et déjà très jeune, je faisais déjà partie du mouvement d'action catholique de l'enfance. Donc j'étais responsable des mouvements des jeunes. Et c'est à ce moment-là que les choses ont commencé à aller mal au pays. C'était un président qui a pris le pouvoir, puis petit à petit, la folie des grandeurs, il voulait se couronner comme empereur. Moi, je, quand j'étais chez moi, je voulais venir au Canada étudier. Et puis, il euh, y a un Canadien qui est allé là-bas pour mettre un projet sur pied dans mon pays d'origine. Puis mais finalement, c'est ce monsieur qui est devenu mon mari. Pour moi, c'est ça. Je... C'est vrai que ça fait partie de l'appartenance. On appartient au Canada. Maintenant, on fait membre de la communauté du Canada. Mais le fait qu'on nous a mis tous ensemble sur le même pays d'égalité, les pays pauvres comme les pays riches aussi, 
le pays du tiers monde, comme là où je viens aussi, par rapport à d'autres pays d'Europe, les gens qui ont vécu ici, là, pour moi, ça démontre encore euh, que ce pays a une force qui vient de partout. Si les jeunes sont conscients que ce, ce, ce pays nous appartient à tous, ils feront attention aux autres, aux nouveaux arrivés, aux gens de différentes couleurs, parce que la terre nous appartient à tout le monde. Mais le Canada vraiment est un pays spécial. For Tatiana from Russia, Canada was a life-saving place, which accepted her family with her daughter, who had a rare life-threatening condition, the inability to absorb protein. Canada gives us a hand. We received a special permission from Ministry of Health to, to come here because usually uh, countries not accepting uh, families with uh, handicapped kids. And we came here and we received such a warm greeting that <clears throat> till now I cannot hear the oh, Canada without tears in my eyes <clears throat> because this country gave my daughter chance to survive and chance to live a full and healthy life and gave us the, the chance to know other people, to have a second profession, to learn a lot about the world. And I felt like I belong to this society. It's very difficult to wiggle your way somewhere in society when you're just coming in 40 years old. It's difficult. First of all, we joined the church and uh, met with the church community. Then we joined the uh, small Russian society. And then you came with your project, which made my world really bigger. And I'm so glad that you let me participate in this project. I met other people who's very genuine. They are not a uh, real artist, but they have a feeling that they have to deliver something what they feel about their nation. And this work bond me and let me understand the Canadian society better through the people, through their work. Some of the block makers came from war-torn countries. Their participation in the project was a way of sharing the beautiful and peaceful nature of their cultural heritage and homeland, the portion that is often overshadowed by conflicts. Their stories tell of loss and healing and the rebuilding of their lives. We left Iraq for, the, uh, for political problems, you know, with what was Saddam Hussein and the war. We don't want to be, we want to be safe. So we came here for just to live in a peaceful country, away from all the war, away from all the trouble. You know, a lot of people, of course, we lost during those wars because it's only not only the war with the with Iran, then the war, the war with the Gulf. You know, the Gulf War. Not a lot of people they were they know a lot of about Iraq actually. So that's why I wanted in the in this project show the good face of Iraq, so that if you go to Iraq and they show you the museums, the you know, what we have from civilization, the good people, the universities, those educated people which of Iraq, at that time they know what is Iraq. I chose that piece because it has like uh, a few stuff uh, from my country. Black, that we call the black color, it's, it's uh, a sample of the oil. And those, uh, the golden stuff, the wheat, although it's back home, we say back home is our country, I think, but still, Canada is like, we can't live without Canada anymore. Yeah. Marta Vizcarra was once a social activist in El Salvador. She worked with her sister to help poor women and inform them of their rights. This was during the turbulent 1980s. Moi, je suis eh, de formation travailleuse social. Eh, au Salvador, je, je travaillais de ça. Mais à partir de, de mon travail, de mon engagement en tant que travail social, moi, je travaillais avec eh, des femmes. Beaucoup de femmes qui avaient besoin de, de, les, faire, de, de les faire connaître ces droits. Alors, à ce moment-là, à mon pays, il y avait la guerre. 
Il y avait une guerre civile qui a coûté à peu près 90 000 morts et beaucoup d'exilés, de, beaucoup de disparus aussi. Alors, quand moi j'ai travaillé avec les femmes, et c'était comme un une problème pour, pour l'armée. Ils ne voulaient pas qu'on parle de, de rien de développement pour les gens. Alors, quand, quand moi j'étais en train de travailler, et ils sont allés me chercher pour, pour m'emprisonner. Il y avait une institution qui s'appelait la Garde Nationale. Alors, j'étais à la Garde Nationale, c'est seulement que j'étais en qualité de disparu. Alors, tandis que les gens ne me trouvaient pas, la, la Garde Nationale pouvait me faire toutes sortes de, de, de blessures, de coupes électriques, de, de, de frappes, de, toutes, toutes sortes de, de, de choses. Et normalement, si, la, si on était emprisonné, disparu, on ne pouvait pas euh, s'en sortir vivant. Mais comme je dis, c'est merci à ma mère, merci à ma famille, à des amis qui, qui se sont euh, communiqués avec beaucoup de monde et pour comme ça qu'ils m'ont trouvé à, à, dans telle, telle prison. Mais après ça, il y avait ma famille qui m'a dit « Non, c'est mieux que tu quittes le pays parce que tu ne peux pas rester ici. » Ils m'ont donné refuge au Canada. Marta has devoted her life here in Canada to helping others. And though she still remembers those terrible times, she created a block representing positive memories of everyday life back in El Salvador. On voulait faire quelque chose qui nous représentait. C'est quelque chose pas exotique, mais c'est un peu quelque chose qui parle de notre vie. Malgré qu'on a vécu la guerre, malgré qu'on est pauvre, malgré qu'on a beaucoup de difficultés, on est un peuple vraiment joyeux. Les petits, mor petits morceaux qu'on a fait, c'est une partie de toute la, la globalité qu'on a au Canada, mais que c'est là qu'on qu peut regarder toute la différence qu'on a. The quilt is a collection of cultural differences that are threaded together by common values, compassion, and the desire for a better world. These core values are what Ketley Hamilton dreams of, for her people in Haiti. Collaboration, amour, fraternité, le sérieux dans ce qu'on fait. Donc tout ce qu'il y a de bon ici au Canada ou en Argentine ou, ou en Europe, c'est ce qui, c'est ce que je voudrais voir pour the making of the quilt took many years of dedicated work by volunteers, community groups, donors, thousands of ordinary people, each contributing in his or her own way. The quilt has traveled across the country from Newfoundland to British Columbia. It has crossed the far north from Labrador to Yellowknife. After each exhibit, it is curated and carefully stored by volunteers, not knowing where and how it will continue on its unique journey. A journey which, like the making of the quilt, relies on faith and hope. From an artistic point of view, the, the stepping outside of the traditional box of how things are done and, and what's possible that way, of being able to make a project without somebody just giving you the money and saying here it is you can do it and if I don't have it I don't do it of starting out and, and walking in, in faith piece by piece and of persevering there's a lot of lessons to be gained that way. The most important message that the quilt team wants to share is the message that belonging is a fundamental need of each human being that there needs to be a valued place for everyone in our world. The dream of the project is to inspire to develop compassion and respect for others, and to give people hope in a personal way, to move individuals, communities, and society towards positive change. The real quilt that's being woven here is the human quilt. It's the relationship. It's the invisible tapestry of humanity. It was our dream and our vision that this would show or tell people that there's still a possibility in the world. I think sometimes we lose hope. 
We see the troubles and the wars and the things that happen and the greed and we're bombarded with it and we think this is the way it's always going to be or has to be. This is a reminder to people that it doesn't have to be that way. But the way to change it is not waiting for a politician or a symposium to decree that the world is going to be different. The way that happens is from the bottom up. It happens with ordinary people like you and I, piece by piece, how I treat my neighbor, how my child treats her fellow students, the compassion we have for our fellow worker, how I treat you today, what I give you, if I listen to you, if I care about you in a real way, in a down-to-earth practical way, that's what's going to change the world.